welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atu Kweisen, and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. Today, I am not going to be discussing any piece of literature, but will rather be sharing with you the presidential address that I delivered to the Virtual African Studies Association Conference that took place from November 18th to 21st, 2020. The African Studies Association was founded in 1957 and has grown to become the leading family for African Studies scholars anywhere in the world. I held the presidency of the association from November 2019. So this was my outgoing lecture as president. In this lecture, I share a little bit of my childhood surrounded by oral storytelling and an eclectic array of books. I then proceed to share my enthusiasm for oral story storytelling and show how it can be used as an analytical tool to examine phenomena well beyond the story worlds of my childhood. I draw lessons from these oral stories to discuss other aspects of scholarship I have pursued in my career, such as the forms of trotural lorry inscriptions in Accra and their relationship to the context of multilingualism. I also draw on oral storytelling modes to describe the principle of sentimental education and how we identify with the lives of others, not only through the oral folk tale, but also through the novel, the cinema, the television soap opera, and on social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and various others. I hope you will enjoy the lecture. Thank you very much. Let me start off by invoking the names of my family's dearly departed. Ma Rosie, Eja Emmanuel, Mama Angeline, Tonton Paul, Tontine Emily, and AC. In Mexico and Italy, they enshrine the memorialization of their dearly departed in the Day of the Dead, when there are elaborate rituals for commemorating their dead ones and keeping their names alive. In the Akan tradition from which I hail, we invoke our ancestors through the pouring of libation on special occasions, such as the naming of a newborn child, at traditional wedding ceremonies, and also during the observation of funerary rites. But there's also a basis for remembering our ancestors and acknowledging them as often as possible. The ancient Egyptians held that there are two forms of death. The first is that of the physical body. And the second is when your loved ones stop mentioning your name. And in a recent interview on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Lenny Kravitz shared his own insight or the value of remembering the dead. He said, the beautiful thing is, even though a person may not be on the planet anymore, it doesn't mean that your relationship with them can't evolve based upon what's going on in your spirit and in your mind. As an African, I take these insights very seriously. I also want to thank God for taking us all through what has been 
one of the most difficult years in recent memory. 2020 has exposed us to much that is depressing and terrifying. And yet, after the weeks of COVID-induced lockdown from March and the killing of George Floyd at the end of May, 2020 has also shown us how much we depend for our mental well-being on the sharing of stories of our malaise, our lethargy, our vulnerabilities, and our sheer shock and horror are the things that the year has brought upon us. It is not a hyperbole to suggest that today the stories of our shared tribulations as circulated on all forms of social and other media have sustained our sense of belonging to a joint community of suffering and human values. The universal outrage that was expressed across the world at the death of George Floyd revealed also the sense in which injustice can make us feel contaminated and soiled just by bearing witness to it. That the unfolding scene of George Floyd's death could so incense so many of us, even though images of police brutality against black people have been in wide circulation both in the US and elsewhere for a very long time, also helped to show the degree to which the framing of the stories we hear and read have an effect in eliciting our identification with the plight of others. At one level, this seems to be a fairly banal fact, not worth much commentary, except that the events around George Floyd concentrated the efficacy of stories in a way that had only been expressed in a dispersed and diluted manner in earlier instantiations of police brutality, but that now was brought together into an emotionally charged and concentrated form. When George Floyd called for his dead mother, we all shuddered at the realization that our own mothers were being hailed, irrespective of our race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or religious backgrounds. And it is this feature of stories and storytelling and how they elicit our identification with the plight of others that I want to focus upon in my lecture today. I grew up in Accra, the capital of Ghana, surrounded by varied books and lots of oral narratives. My father was an avid reader of all things written. These included newspapers, Buddhist texts, novels, women's magazines, refrigerator manuals, and Shakespeare. There was no knowing what he would be found reading next. This meant that reading became a natural part of the environment in which I and my sisters grew up, and also that our reading habits were completely eclectic. Stories and folk tales also provided my father with opportunities for giving us memorable takes on what passed for the ordinary. One such instance I remember quite clearly happened when I was about 11 or 12 years old and just before leaving for boarding secondary school. He often took us on walks. Sometimes all of us went together, but at other times he took one or the other of us three for a treat. This time it was my turn. We started out by kicking a stone. He kicked it and I kicked it. He kicked it and I kicked it. After about 10 minutes of this seemingly pointless exercise, he turned to me and asked quite unexpectedly, 
How old do you think that little stone is? I was taken completely by surprise, having never thought of a stone in that way before. But then followed the most breathtaking story of the formation of the earth, of volcanoes and avalanches, of magna and igneous rocks. The lesson? Every stone you kick has come a very long way, both geographically and in terms of time. I have never looked at a stone in the same way since. My mother also had stories to tell, but hers were those of the marketplace. Hers were those of rumors, gossip, and urban legends, all generously leavened with great humor and laughter. These were all story genres that I came to discover much later in life as the transactional currencies of the city's social imaginary. The context of stories and storytelling in which I grew up came not only to have a major impact on my imagination, but also on my appetite for books and how I read them. For me, there was no distinction growing up between fact and fiction. Everything I read seemed to have a specific reality for me, which was sometimes quite intense. I did not actually learn how to read properly until I was about eight years old. But, could, but once I could read by myself, I began to devour everything that I could find, including all of my father's many books, as I have already mentioned. The children's library, about a mile and a half from where we lived, became my favorite hideout. I quickly exhausted their holdings and moved on to the public library in Accra city center. Then followed the British Council Library, one of whose major attractions was that it had permanently running air conditioning. My high school was some 60 miles outside of Accra, and once I had rapidly exhausted my two exeats per term to get away to the libraries back in the city, I just proceeded to sneak out of school and spend entire days in either one of the libraries, shuffling my meager borrowing rights so that I will always have a couple of library books with me to take back to school. Now, all this hearing of stories and reading of books formed part of my sentimental education. A sentimental education prepares the way for how we come to identify with the lives of others. But it is simply about how our sentiments develop and attach themselves to persons, objects, and events. It is also about the distribution of our attention on what we decide to be right or wrong. In other words, a sentimental education also implies the development of a set of ethical dispositions regarding our own evolving selves, as well as our relationship to others, both like us and unlike us. And it has been made clear that certain stories are designed to build, build walls rather than bridges between us. Even though I will not be talking about the effect of fake news on our sense of community, it is important to note that the manufacture of realities completely disconnected from facts has become a potent threat to how we understand the world and our place in it. Before I continue, let me give you a small flavor of what I mean by a sentimental education, by
by sharing with you a folk tale that my father told me when I was a young lad. It involves a singing tortoise strumming on a, a guitar. And this is how it goes. One day, a hunter sets out into the bush to go and hunt for game. But uh, th this day is not a very good day. He can't find anything to shoot and bring back home. So he's a little bit morose and despondent, and he's decided to turn back and head out back home. When he hears a strange sound coming from inside the forest. And so he follows the sound. He follows the sound until he comes to a clearing in the middle of the forest. And what does he see? He sees a tortoise sitting on a rock, playing a guitar and singing this song. Asem penipa, nipa nopi asem, asem penipa, nipa nopi asem, asem penipa, nipa nopi asem, strumming on his guitar, joyously swinging from side to side. The hunter is transfixed. He's never seen anything like this before, but suddenly it strikes him that profit may be had from this phenomenal singing tortoise. So he tiptoes very slowly behind the tortoise and uh, takes his sack that he has carried with him to the hunt and catches the tortoise with the guitar and everything, puts it on his shoulder and heads off whistling to uh, his uh, village. But when he gets to the village, he doesn't go straight home. He goes straight instead to the king's palace and tells the king, King, oh dear king, Oga king, he says, as though he's Nigerian, but he's not really Nigerian. Oga king, I have a major uh, phenomenon here in my sack and we can make money out of it. The king, Bimus, asks, what, what is this you're talking about? It is a singing tortoise. A singing tortoise, says the king. Yes, a singing tortoise. And I want you to get the townspeople together, uh, beat the gong gong, get them all together to the city square, and I will display the tortoise and it will sing. And please uh, collect some money, you know, $5 each. You know, we are, we are in a global economy, even in this village, so $5 each for everyone. The king is a little bit skeptical, but he agrees on one condition. He tells him, if the tortoise does not sing on the third count, you will lose your head. The man says, the hunter says, not a problem. You will soon see. So there will the, be the gong gong, everyone comes, they pay their $5 each, and they settle the tortoise in the center sitting this time on a very apparently comfortable uh, stool and he's supposed to sing sing tortoise sing the tortoise is quiet sing tortoise sing the hunter is breaking into a cold sweat by now sing tortoise sing the tortoise are not singing and immediately the hunter is taken away and beheaded Immediately, the hunter leaves the scene. The tortoise starts singing and strumming on his guitar. Asem penipa, nipa nopi asem. 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 The moral of the story is fairly straightforward, which, as the song says, is that it is often as humans that go and look for trouble and not the other way around. This calls to mind a wise saying of one of the characters in a novel by Chinua Achebe. And he says, the thing that will destroy a man starts off as an appetite. In the tale of the singing tortoise, it was the hunter's appetite for profit that ultimately proved fatal to him. 
Now, as every Africanist knows, African genres of orality, such as folk tales, are often polysemic and tend to be composed not only of narrative elements, but will also likely contain proverbs, songs, enigmas, wise sayings, and even direct commentaries on the context of narration. A good example of this polysemy is to be found in the novellas of Amos Tutula, such as The Palm Wine Drinkard in My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. All these incorporated subgenres are combined in such a way as to captivate the audience's attention and to keep them actively engaged in animating the story they are listening to. The context of oral storytelling is thus active rather than passive, and it is this activeness that generates our identification with the characters and situations within the folk tale. This is part of the process of sentimental education that is guaranteed by the form of the oral folk tale. Furthermore, each subgenre nestled within the larger oral story incorporates polysemy as an essential feature of its makeup. And the polysemous potential of both the folk tale's whole and its parts is carried forward into whatever new domains the subgenres are transferred into, thus also implying that the sentimental education inherent to conditions of oral storytelling is part of a lively zodiac of possibilities. It is this inherent polysemy that I point to in the chapter on Trotral Lorry inscriptions in my book, Oxford Street, Accra. One thing that I came to realize after the book was published is the degree to which the polysemy of these oral genres once transferred to the written scripts of Trotro slogans also raised implications for the role of English within the multilingual urban environment. The nature of the multilingual environment of a place like Accra means that the writing that we see across the urban landscape is the product of various translational transactions between different languages, as well as being inherent to the polysemous genres of orality themselves. Even when the slogan on a lorry is in English, what we see as its translation does not efface the local language source or its cultural modalities of expression. Translation within a multilingual context thus fundamentally works to estrange the English language text, raising doubts about what kind of English it was in the first place. Take these slogans, for example. One has an image of uh, the word Barak. One has Lumumba written on it. One has, if you see me, tear your face. And the last one has, in trust be God. The ones on Barak and Lumumba are self-explanatory and are good examples of political slogans that have been commonplace in, in the urban landscape. More complicated are the other two. If you see me tear your face is especially fascinating because it is grammatically correct but idiomatically wrong. The slogan is a direct translation from the Akan saying, Wuhumia Tiwenim, with the source of confusion here residing in the word te, which can mean both to open 
as in to smile, and also to tear, as in things are torn into pieces. And so the slogan simply means, smile when you see me, except that it has used the false sense of tick rather than what would be the idiomatically correct version. The trick in the slogan, however, is that if you were not aware of the Akan language background to it, you would completely miss the fact that this slogan is a poke in the eye of educated monolinguals. For what the slogan is really doing is to say that the English language surface is automatically entailed in an Akan latent content which is rising up to convert the surface of the text away from any principles of correctness we might apply in trying to understand it. In other words, there is a subtle struggle taking place between Akan and English, which plays out on the surface of this slogan, and that requires a rapid oscillation between the two languages. The slogan, in trust with God, is also very funny. But this time, the humor does not come from any local language latent subtext, but from the fact that the slogan is playing with the discourse of Christianity that is now commonplace in many parts of the country. Again, we may wish in our ignorance to conclude that the writer of the slogan is simply grammatically challenged. But given the fact that many slogan writers have at least a minimum of basic education, I prefer to read the mistake as entirely deliberate. It seems to me to be saying that God perfectly understands what I am saying, even though you skeptics and naysayers may be thinking otherwise. And that is why I trust him and not any of you losers. But this slogan may also be playing with the discourse of materialism that is encapsulated in the ubiquitous American dollar. As anyone familiar with American currency will know, the words in God we trust is written above an image of the White House on one side of the dollar note. Is the true slogan then saying that the Americans have got things the wrong way around, even in their much vaunted democracy, and that we all Africans ought to beware of adopting and mimicking their ways unthinkingly? There is no real way of knowing the true import of in trust with God. But the fact that the slogan leaves all these possibilities open is a mark of its inherent polysemy. What we find in all these slogans is that within a multilingual context that is suffused by orality, English itself is having to struggle for its place. Unlike what we find in formal government context or in that of, of classrooms in Africa, within the urban public commons, the place of the English language or of any other Europhone language, be it French, Portuguese, Spanish, is not guaranteed in its dominance, but is always subject to challenges from other languages with which it is obliged to interact. I want to leave the implications of the polysemy of trotro slogans and oral genres aside for now, and instead return back to the issue of sentimental education that is provided by both oral and written discourses in general. One of the things that I can say is shared by the folk tales of my childhood and all the books that I read 
alongside them is that they were all united in eliciting from me a form of identification with a condition of characters both near and far. As, as I was growing up, when I read Alexander Dumas's The Three Musketeers or Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart, they triggered equally for me a diverse imaginative universe. The identification with the woes and tribulations of fictional characters has continued throughout my engagements with literature from different parts of the world, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude to Titi Dangaremba's Nervous Conditions, from Toni Morrison's Beloved to the poetry of Kamal Brathwaite and from the theater of Wole Shoinka to the tragedies of the Greeks and Shakespeare. Some of you may already have seen my discussions of different kinds of literary works in critic reading writing. The YouTube channel I started some four months ago to use literature in talking about various elements of culture, politics, and society from a diverse range of perspectives. I have wondered for a while now whether it might be desirable to trace the long genealogy of identification with the lives of others that we draw from the folk tale through theater and the novel and onto the ways in which such identification is enacted through social media in general. In simple terms, an orally told folk or fairy tale elicits a mode of identification with its protagonists, primarily on the basis of what Abiola Irele describes as vital immediacy of the context of uh, oral storytelling. We should not understand vital immediacy to be limited only to modes of oral storytelling, since all forms of music and even dance also transpose modes of vital immediacy into different formats. At any rate, the novel was to generate a new process of identification for the reader this time severed from the vital immediacy of oral conditions and yet no less profound in its implications for forms of identification. The novel installed modes of silent privacy in our engagement with literature and by this replaced the vital immediacy of oral storytelling with a different form of engagement with the lives of imagined others. While privacy and silent reading are the novel's main forms of engagement, a fertile attentiveness is also central to the means by which readers identify with the character's tribulations and the conditions in which these are expressed. We should also add that the novel must be credited with generating a new form of interlocutory headspace. That is to say, the process by which a reader proceeds to ruminate inside of their own heads about the characters they are reading about and may have identified with. The stronger the mental rumination that is generated from our reading, the stronger the impulse to tell someone else about what we are reading. It is almost compulsive, and I think may be said to be a universal quality of reading any literature that fully engages with our attention. It is almost like falling in love. That the hero or heroine within the novel is composed of words, and as such, is in a sense aligned to other word-created dimensions of the text, such as metaphors or the sense of space, 
end of time, end of ethical dispositions, etc. Also means that the characters and the language with which they are described provide the sinking mechanism for us to get aligned to an entirely new universe of significance. The ways in which the novel generates rumination differs fundamentally from the ways in which the oral folk tale or theater does this. In both uh, folk tale and theater, the domain of story is mediated through the embodied presence of the storyteller or actor. And it is the persuasiveness of this embodied presence, in addition to the other components of the story that produces our sense of attachment or identification with the characters and the situations being represented. The novel does away with this embodied mediation, relying exclusively on how it procures and retains the quality of our attention and our belief in the reality of what is being depicted to us. From the public screening of 10 of the Lumiere Brothers short films in Paris in 1895, cinema came to interpose itself into the domain of how we identify with characters unlike ourselves, thus supplementing and also taking new directions what pertains in the folktale and the novel. Cinema's combination of language and moving images served to retranscribe the context of vital immediacy into ever-changing domains and configurations. The early era of the cinema was soon obliged to contend with that of public television broadcasting, which after the Second World War added a fundamentally new dimension to our modes of identification in the forms of serialized and continually evolving stories. If you think back to the early era of soap operas from the 1960s, for example, it is easy to see how such programs got viewers to identify with the lives of persons they thought to be much like themselves and to return repeatedly to the television to watch how their destinies might unfold. In fact, we might even say that the TV soap opera generated characters more similar to the ordinary viewer than what was to be found in certain strands of 19th century and early 20th century novels. One such strand of novels that I have had a chance to discuss on critic reading writing in the episode on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is the masculine adventure narrative that was commonplace in the 18th and much of the 19th century until Conrad upturned it with his own story set in the Congo. Starting with Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe of 1719, R.L. Stevenson's Treasure Island, 1883, H. Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines, 1885, as well as Rudyard Kipling's Kim, 1901, and the novellas of A.G. Henty, among various others, young European boys and men were depicted in different parts of the empire doing all manner of things, including conquering the natives and attempting to reveal the ways of God to them. Many of these novels were blockbusters when they were first published, with some running into several editions and selling 100,000 copies. They were also frequently given as presents to young boys and were a major popular supplement to what was to be found 
in the works of Jane Austen, George Eliot, Arthur Conan Doyle, and various other novelists of the period. The early television soap opera from the 1960s instead placed before viewers the fragmentary life narratives of different characters in everyday contexts facing mundane yet by the same token momentous life choices just like the multitude of viewers themselves. That the plots of soap operas were relayed day by day or week by week or in whatever cycle of predictable regularity uh, that was enjoined for the television ensured that viewers of soap operas were being encouraged to imaginatively identify with the vicissitudes of the characters in the soaps according to a rhythmic cycle that allowed the identification to punctuate the viewer's ordinary everyday lives. Television soaps have also been a great way of generating conversations around the workplace water cooler. A great cinematic validation of the changing nature of identification from the cinema to the television in both form and content uh, can be found in the Truman Show of 1998, which I think has not been adequately scrutinized for what it sought to articulate about audience identification with characters in the soaps by the end of the 20th century. That soap operas such as Coronation Street, Dynasty, East Enders, and Home and Away first reached markets well outside their regional viewerships in America, Britain, and Australia, and then spawned variants in the telenovelas of Latin America, which are extremely popular in Ghana, it did not alter the efficacy of audience identifications that was central to the soap opera success. Then came reality TV, which exploded in popularity in the 1990s and early 2000s. Competition-based reality TV shows in which one competitor is eliminated per episode or where there's a panel of judges make for especially strong forms of viewer identification. Unlike the soap opera or telenovela, the peculiar power of reality TV is that irrespective of the format, Survivor, America's Got Talent, X Factor, So You Think You Can Dance, Blind Date, Big Brother, etc. They are first and last gladiatorial contests. The mode of audience identification with the characters in the gladiatorial contest is arguably different from what pertains to the soap opera, but essentially requires that as a viewer, you want someone to fail so that another person of your own identification succeeds. But you can also switch identification from a winner turned loser to a loser that suddenly looks like a prospective winner and so on. That there is no bloodshed or death in the reality, gladiatorial reality TV show unlike what is described in the era of the Romans, or indeed of today's Spanish matadors, does not alter the essentially gladiatorial character of reality TV format. And now we come to social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. But I want to stick with Facebook and Instagram primarily, since it seems to me that these are the two platforms that have had the greatest 
and continuing impact on youth identification in Africa. The first significant mark of Facebook, especially, is the integration of various multimodal platforms that allow people to combine text, still photos, and moving images, as well as links to other pages, pieces of information, and so on, for the curation and constant reproduction of people's uh, self-identifications. Instagram is also very important because it has made possible for Africans and Black people all over the world to generate and circulate new images of what it is to be beautiful. Instagram influences such as the Senegalese Emisal, Nigerian Asiyami Gold and Oni Moss, and French Cameroonian Frederic Harel have given us some of the most amazing images of black bodies and black environments that now challenge the standard images of Western beauty that have dominated the fashion industry uh, until recently. There is still some way to go for the black body to be considered as a universal standard of beauty and indeed of value. But what we now find on Instagram is a real possibility for identification with the idea of a black beauty. It is the fact that people no longer have to necessarily identify with fictional others in folk tales, novels, films, or on TV, but they, that they have all the multimodal tools at their disposal to insert themselves into the circuits of spectatorship for others to look at them, that social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and the others have had such a profound significance for thinking about the modes of identification with the lives of others. In many respects, the multimodality of social media platforms and the opportunities to shuttle between text, photograph, moving image, and even links to other sources of information means that they mimic the polysemy inherent to oral genres that I spoke of uh, to start with. In other words, I am trying to suggest that the multimodality of social media platforms, uh, such as the ones I've mentioned, must be studied alongside the polysemy of oral genres, not as distinctively different ephemeral features of either mode, but as essentially comparable structural features for eliciting identification. It is true, of course, that social media depends on particular algorithms to class items on one's feed and thus to ensure that one is confirmed in one's tastes and biases. But these algorithms are also a means of mediating identification. Here I want to add that the value of thinking about narrative theory as a close relation of algorith algorithmic theory behind the multimodal social media platforms is a way of opening up different vistas from what we have right now. My hunch is that if compared correctly, we may find that our oral folk tales, whether from Africa or elsewhere, have some to teach us about how to understand the power of the social media platforms. And by this means, we may be able to devise our own and distinctive platforms by drawing on the deep polysemic logic of oral storytelling. If the journey from the oral folktale to today's social media has anything to teach us, it is that stories are the social currency of our everyday lives, and that what we need are more stories, not fewer. The more diverse stories we have, and in as many forms and media as possible, the more we can guarantee that our sentimental education is not hijacked by the narrow-minded purveyors 
of false reality that try to pass this off as truth. This is especially crucial in a year like 2020, where much has happened to shock us, but from which we have also gathered insights for the future. Thank you very much. If you like this episode, please remember to give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell, and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.